In this lecture, we continue the introduction to statistical inference. Previously, uh, we covered estimation. And in this one, we introduce you to the concept of testing hypotheses. Well, we learned about estimation as part of inference. Now we're going to learn about hypothesis testing. We're testing some kind of hypothesis or a claim. Now, claims are always about parameters. So let's say a company makes a claim about its product. Example we have here is a frozen yogurt company says their yogurt has no more than 90 calories per cup. Now they're not talking about one particular cup of yogurt. They're talking about, it's a parameter, about the mu that the population mean, you know, when it comes to calories per cup, the mu is less than or greater than 90. Okay, so that's called, uh, we're going to do a hypothesis test using the same kind of sample evidence we saw in estimation. Remember the sample evidence is N, X bar, and S. Okay, that's called the sample evidence. So we're going to use that sample evidence to test the claim. Claims, which we call a hypothesis, is always about a parameter. So we're going to take a sample. Suppose the sample is N equals 100 cups. From that, we're going to get the sample mean. Now, again, if the sample mean is 90 or less, 90 calories or less, that's it. We can't uh, t accuse the company of lying. Their claim was that uh, they had, you know, 90, uh, no more than 90 calories per cup. The sample evidence supports that. You don't need statistics then. Everything is done for you. The sample evidence supports the claim. What happens if it's more than 90? Again, the question is how much more? It could be slightly more. It could be a lot more. In statistics, you know, we have to do a test so that we can ascertain whether the company has basically um, lied about their uh, yogurt. And again, if you look at it, uh, let's uh, we all would agree it would be a tiny drop more, let's say 90.1 calories, probably they're not lying. That could be sampling error. So they, you know, they're telling the truth. But what happens if it's really more, a lot more? Suppose it's 500 calories a cup. And even uh, a non-statistician would say there's no way that their yogurts have have less than 90 calories per cup. When our sample n equals 100 found that the average was 500, it's clear the company has not been telling us the truth. And so this is best, essentially the basis of hypothesis testing. There's going to be some kind of claim, and it's always about a parameter. We've been looking at claims about mu. We're going to take some sample a sample mean. We're going to get the sample evidence. We're going to get the mean, this, the standard deviation based on n. And we're going to see if this claim is reasonable or not. Okay, now let's learn some of the language of hypothesis testing. Okay, so we're going to talk about the claim. As we said before, there's a claim. It's a claim about a parameter. Okay, the actual claim we're going to call the null hypothesis. See, H and little zero, that's called the null hypothesis. That's where we're going to put the hypothesized parameter value, and that eventually will be compared with the sample value. So we have HO, um, in this case mu, about mu. Then we have H1, that's called the alternate hypothesis. That's only accepted if we reject HO, and that's a decision that's made based on looking at the sample evidence. So either we're going to reject HO, essentially telling the company they're lying, or we don't reject, call it accepted in quotes. Okay, because we technically don't really accept HO, we just don't have the evidence to reject. All right, so we're gonna have a claim about a parameter, it's HO, and the alternative, in case HO gets rejected, we have an alternative hypothesis, and uh, the sample evidence is going to be used to make this decision. Let's take a look at some of the things that can happen when we test the hypothesis. Uh, you'll see that we have something we call the state of nature, the columns. Uh, either the null hypothesis really is true or it really is false. We don't know. Why don't we know? Because we're only, we only collected a sample. All we know is the sample evidence. Uh, we don't know uh, the population parameter. On the other hand, the rows, uh, we can look at the decision that we make. 
at the as a result of the hypothesis test, either we will reject the null hypothesis or we won't reject the null hypothesis. So there's two things that that uh, two possible outcomes of our decision, and there's also uh, two possible things that could be true about the null hypothesis. Uh, let's take a look. If the null hypothesis is true and we don't reject it, that's good. We made the correct decision. On the other side, if the null hypothesis is false and we do reject it, there's another good. We did another correct decision. The other two cells represent possible errors that can occur. We call those errors alpha and beta, or sometimes type 1 error and type 2 error. If the null hypothesis is false, but we end up not rejecting it, we say uh, the evidence doesn't, doesn't let us reject this null hypothesis. We made a boo-boo, and it's called a beta error, or an error of type 2. If the null hypothesis is true and we reject it anyway, then we've made an alpha error. Uh, that's an error of type 1. If you were wondering if this alpha is the same alpha that we looked at when we talked about estimation, confidence interval estimations, and um, the, the level of confidence was also called 1 minus alpha, it is indeed exactly the same uh, quantity. It's exactly the same alpha. If we have an alpha error of 0.05, meaning uh, the, the error that we make when we reject the null hypothesis, even if it's true, that's equivalent to, if we were doing a confidence interval, uh, it's equivalent to using a confidence level of 95%, 1 minus alpha. There is a trade-off between uh, these two types of errors, the alpha error and the beta error. We would love to be able to say, oh, error is a bad thing. Uh, I want all my errors to be very, very small. Can I get both alpha and beta errors down to zero? Uh, how do I do that? And of course, even though we would love to do that, we can't. Um, these, these are, uh, this is a trade-off very much like the one we saw in the estimation lecture between the level of confidence, which you know is related to alpha, and the size of the interval. You can't have, you can't um, uh, keep on increasing the, the amount of confidence, which you would like, and uh, narrowing the size of the interval, which you would also like. You can't do both of those. Well, in this case, we can't keep reducing uh, the, let's say, the alpha error and uh, keep reducing the beta error at the same time. It, it doesn't work that way. They work counter to each other. Uh, let's think about it. Um, with the alpha error, what we're doing is we're rejecting the null hypothesis when we should not reject it, when it's true. Well, as the probability of this type of error um, goes down because we're trying to lower it. We're reducing the the uh, probability of uh, of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true, and we we're reducing it lower, lower, lower as much as we can. Well, what happens? What happens is we're going to be rejecting less. We're going to be uh, reducing the chance of re rejecting altogether, which automatically is going to raise the beta error, the, the error that we make when we um, accept the null hypothesis, even if it's false. I'm trying to understand the trade-off between the alpha and the beta error. Remember, the alpha error is the error of rejecting HO. It's the error of rejection. The rejection. You've rejected HO when it's, HO is true. The beta error is the error of acceptance. You've accepted HO when HO is false. Okay, that's the tr so we're going to see there's a trade-off, and the legal system understands the trade-off very well. You can have a legal system where it's extremely difficult to convict criminals. If we're so afraid of incarcerating innocent people, we make it very hard. You've got to be super certain. The judge says, I want absolute certainty before I put anyone in prison. Well, that system 
will be committing another kind of error. You're making it so hard, no one's going to get convicted. You don't convict anyone. On the other hand, you can try the other approach. You, you make it very easy to convict. Okay? Cause you want, so you're going to have a legal system. It's so easy to convict. Well, guess what's going to happen? A lot of innocent people end up behind bars. So what do you do? You have the error of acceptance and the error of rejection. Putting people in prison and making it, very, or making it impossible to put people in prison. So our legal system actually kind of compromises, like we do. We try to keep the alpha error low, but we also worry about the beta error. So what our legal system says, we don't require complete certainty. Like we don't say beyond a shadow of a doubt. We don't require complete certainty, but you do want beyond reasonable doubt. So again, we're trading off the alpha error with the beta error. The key point is you can't make both zero. It's impossible because they... They're not the different kinds of errors. We can see this uh, this trade-off between the alpha and the beta errors in quality control. Suppose you have a company and they buy ch computer chips for their smartphones and they buy fifty thousand at a at a time. All right. Now, the, what a, a smart company does, no pun intended, what they'll do is they'll take a sample of a hundred chips and decide on the basis of the sample whether to reject the entire shipment. A huge shipment comes in, and now they have to take a random sample of 100 chips and make a decision. Now, if they're going to reject on the basis of even like one chip in the sample of 100 that's defective, and they're going to use that as, uh, you know, oh, we found one defective chip in 100, and so they reject immediately, they could end up uh, rejecting a lot of good shipments. On the other hand, if the firm is too liberal, say, ah, a couple chips here and there, what do we care? And they accept the entire shipment, and they make it very easy to accept the uh, shipment. And they always assume, oh, it's a sampling error. Then they're going to make the error of acceptance. This is why government and industry generally work with an alpha of 0.05. They're willing to make errors occasionally, but they don't want to end up rejecting shipment after shipment. Because, again, you have to realize when you're talking about quality control, you know, there's always going to be a few defective chips. They'll have a standard that they, uh, but they, they know they can't have zero. So again, notice how the acceptance error and the rejection error kind of there's a tension between the two, and there's a trade-off. So we try to keep the alpha error low, but we don't make it zero because we don't want to shoot up the beta error. If the alpha error goes down too much, the beta error goes up a lot. So we try to keep the alpha error at 0.05. Give you some steps and hypothesis testing. You may not need it. In fact, most people don't need the steps. But uh, if you need it, here they are. Step one: you formulate HO and H1. HO again is the null hypothesis. It's about a parameter, and H1 is the alternative hypothesis. For example, you might say HO is that mu is 12.7 years. H1 is mu is not. Okay. Then we specify the level of significance, the alpha to be used. Generally. The government likes 0.05. Once in a while, you'll see 0.01, and very rarely 0.10. Okay, but you're going to have to have a level of significance to decide on when you're going to reject HO. Okay. So uh, step three: select a test statistic. Now we're going to be learning about Z, but later on we'll learn about a t-test. You don't. You're not limited to Z. You might use a t-distribution. You may learn about the f-distribution. Okay, that's step three. Decide what test statistic. Rule of thumb, large samples, and you're testing the mean, you're going to be using Z. Some very small samples, you might have to use T. Four, you establish the critical value of values of the test statistic needed to reject HO. And you'll draw the picture, and you must draw that picture. Then you'll take the, t the, uh, the uh, sample evidence, and you'll actually turn it into a test statistic. You'll get the actual value. We call that the computed value of the test statistic. So when you're all finished, you'll write Z equals, it'll be some number, or T if you're working with small samples. You'll write Z equals, and that's the value, the computed value or actual value of the test statistic. And based on this, you're going to make a decision, either going to reject HO or not reject HO. And again, this is all going to be done by drawing the diagram. You can have what we call critical values, and you're going to see where the sample evidence falls. Does it fall into the what we call the acceptance region, or will you be will it be in the rejection region? Let's see how we set up a hypothesis test. 
A company claims that its uh, soda vending machines deliver exactly, on the average, eight ounces of soda. So that's a claim about mu, the population parameter from uh, the production process um, of the vending machines. Why do it, does it have to be exactly um, within uh, you know certain uh, limits? Well, if we have too much, if we find out that on average these vending machines really deliver um, way too much uh, soda, for one thing, it could ruin the machine. It'll overflow the cup. For another thing, we're wasting product. What if we find out that uh, these machines deliver too little, much less than the eight ounces average of soda it's supposed to be delivering to the customers? We're shortchanging our customers. Uh, we have, we're going to have issues in the public relations and in uh, government watchdog agencies. Uh, so we don't want it either way. We want to make sure that the uh, true population parameter is what it's supposed to be. Uh, we have our claim, eight ounces. Uh, that's what we use for the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that mu, the population average uh, amount of soda delivered, uh, is eight ounces. What's the alternate hypothesis? That it's not eight ounces. How could it be not eight ounces? Well, look at the picture. Either it can be very, very much larger uh, than the hypothesized mean, and you see the red region of rejection on the right side, or it could be much smaller than the hypothesized mean, and that's, that, then it would fall into the region of rejection on the left side. So you can see why you have to draw a picture. Um, and if you, we're going to see more problems with this, don't worry. But in this case, all we're doing is formulating it to show you what a two-tailed test looks like. In this problem, uh, we're going to be rejecting either in the right tail or the left tail. If you're too far away from the hypothesized mean on the high side, or if you're too far away from the hypothesized mean on the low side. So both of those tails contain the region of rejection and it's called a two-tailed test. Suppose we're testing at an alpha level of 0.01. That means that we're willing to reject 1% of the time if the null hypothesis is true. And what you see in front of you is a picture of the null hypothesis being true. So that means um, if the null hypothesis is true, we want to be able to reject 1% of the time. We take that alpha, split it in half, put half of a percent in one tail, half of a percent in the other tail, and look up in the Z table to see what Z values will split the distribution like that. Beyond what Z value on the right does the region of rejection start, and beyond what Z value on the left does the region of rejection start? Well, with 0 0.005 in the tail, uh, we we have we've seen this before in uh, the estimation lecture, and in the normal distribution lecture, uh, we end up with a z value of plus 2.575 and minus 2.575. The rest of the problem, um, you know, you will will do eventually, uh, but for now we just want to show you a few problems in terms of how you set them up. So we just saw an example of setting up a problem, a hypothesis testing problem, when we're doing a two-tailed test. Um, so you can get the idea that one of the first things we have to do is decide on whether we have a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. And it's, that's going to be reflected in HO, in the null and the alternate hypotheses. Uh, so the, it's one of the very first things you have to do because formulate HO and H1, if you remember, was part of step one in hypothesis testing. Um, but with a two-tailed test, as we saw, um, the null hypothesis uh, is that the parameter value is equal to a certain value. Uh, the, then the alternate hypothesis is simply that it's not equal. We don't have to say a different value, what value we think it is. All we have to say is that we reject the null hypothesis, so it's not. Um, and that's why when you have a two-tailed test, you split 
the difference and you say I can either reject because it's too large, larger than it should be, or I can reject because it's smaller than it should be. With a one tail test, as you'll see, we're only rejecting on one side of the distribution, either on the high side or on the low side, but not on both. And in that case, uh, our, our alpha region is all in one tail. Let's look at the difference between a one tail test of hypothesis and a two tail test. Uh, we already saw that with a two tail test, uh, one of the key words in the, in the word problem is probably going to be exactly. Um, not necessarily, you, sometimes you may have to figure it out, but certainly if the word exactly is in there, like a company claims that um, its uh, pharmaceutical product has exactly one milligram of aspirin. Okay, you really don't want too little because it won't be effective. You don't want too much because it could be dangerous. Obviously, uh, we're not going to get a, an, an average of exactly 1.00 uh, milligrams of aspirin, um, but there's going to be some wiggle room. And what we're saying is that the mean mu of the distribution is exactly one milligram. And how far away would we have to be on either the high side or the low side in order to reject uh, this hypothesis, to reject this claim? With a one tail test, here's an example. A company claims that its raisin brand has at least 100 raisins in each box. And of course, again, we're talking about an average. And another thing we're looking at is we're assuming that that's a good thing, okay? We're assuming that um, if, if uh, somebody does a collection, does the experiment, collects data, and finds that on the average, there are more than 100 raisins per box, that's okay. No one's gonna have a problem with that. They're not gonna reject it. Imagine if you're testing, doing quality control to test to see if you want to accept the shipment. You're going to accept the shipment. So the problem only arises if you find um, that the sample mean is less than, uh, in this case, 100. Um, it, there's, we know that since we're working with the normal distribution, that there's always going to be a certain probability, a positive probability, that uh, the sample we took really did come from the distribution with the, the mean in the null hypothesis. But we're asking, is it reasonable? All right, is it, could it have been uh, that this distribution is true and we got a different value just because of sampling error? Or perhaps um, that something happened to the machinery and the, the uh, production process no longer turns out um, boxes with at least 100 raisins. Uh, and that's really going to be the key. Is it sampling error that we're observing or is there really a significant difference from H from what HO is supposed to be? All right, here are some more examples. We're going to be looking at both two-tail tests and one-tail tests, different problems, uh, to see how the null hypothesis gets set up. This is purely to look at the setup. Um, in the first problem here, a company claims that its bolts have a circumference of exactly 12 and a half inches. Well, if these bolts are, let's say, there to connect uh, the wing to an airplane, that's kind of important. Uh, you don't want it to be too large. You don't want it to be too small because the wing will fall off. That's pretty bad. Um, so in this case, um, the null hypothesis would be that mu is 12.5 inches, exactly what it's supposed to be. Uh, the null hypothesis, which we accept if we reject the null hypothesis, is that mu is not 12 and a half inches. Um, the second problem is, that, is saying a company claims that its slice of bread has exactly two grams of fiber. And again, from looking at the problem, you get the feeling that you're going to reject if you see that you have a, an average much higher than two so that it's not sampling error. You're going to reject if you see that you have a sample average much lower than two. And the null hypothesis is that mu is exactly two grams, the alternate hypothesis that it's not. 
And remember, the alternate hypothesis, H1, is what we accept if we reject HO. We're going to see an example now of a one-tail test. The company claims that its batteries have an average life of at least. When you see words like at least or at most, you know you're dealing with a one-tail test. So they said at least 500 hours, which means anything after 500, 600, 7, 8, it's all good. The only problem is if it's a little bit below 500, you want to know is it sampling error or not. So the rejection region goes to the left, right, the left tail. Okay, and here's how we set it up. HO, mu is greater than or equal to 500 hours. H1, mu is less than 500. Notice H1 is always pointing to where the rejection region goes. So if you're testing at an alpha of 05, the entire 05 now has to be in the left tail. You don't split it up because it's a one tail test. The only problem is on the left, when you're below 500, if you're too far below and it can't be sampling error, we're going to reject HO. So again, notice that hint, H1 always points to where the rejection region should be. And by the way, the critical value, if you check your zero to Z table, if you want to have 5% in the tail, that means you have between zero and Z, you have 45%, 0.4500. So you look at your Z table, zero to Z, and you want 0.4500, 45% of the area, and you find out the value is, in this case, minus 1.645. It's also a one-tail test. A company claims that its overpriced bottled water has no more than one microgram of benzene, which is poisonous. How do you formulate that? Remember, the, claim, the company's claiming it's no more than. So we write down HO, mu is less than one microgram. H1, if we reject HO, we're, luck, we're left with H1, is that mu is greater than one microgram, which is problematic. You have more than one microgram of benzene. Again, notice we're going to test at the O5 level. So we have to put the entire, it's a one tail test. That means the entire O5 goes in one tail, and in this case, the right tail. Remember, H1's pointing to it. It's only a problem when you have too much. Less, if you have, let's say, a, a trillionth of a microgram, the government's going to be even happier, or zero benzene, and it's even good. Anything on the left is good. It's on the right side where you're getting problems. All right, so since we're testing an O5, the entire O5 is in the right tail and the critical value is plus 1.645. This is an example of a two-tail test and we could do the whole problem for you. If some, a pharmaceutical company claims that each of its pills contains exactly 20 milligrams of Coumadin, that's a blood thinner. And you see why it's a two-tail test. Too much, you'll kill the person. Too little, it won't work. So you want it to be exactly 20 milligrams of Coumadin. Okay, so you take a sample of 64 pills, and you find, here's your sample evidence. Based on your sample of 64, X bar is 20.50, and the standard deviation is 0.80 milligrams. So the question is, should the company's claim be rejected? Test at alpha equals O5. So notice how the steps, are, how we set it up. Formulate the hypotheses. First of all, you realize it's a two-tailed test. It's not at least or at most. It's exactly. So H shows that mu is exactly equals 20 milligrams. H1 is mu is not equal to 20 milligrams. Okay, now we're going to choose the test statistic and find the critical values. Now we're testing at alpha O5, but this is a two-tailed test. So we're going to take the alpha and cut it into two. Half of O5 is O25. Put O25 in the right side, right tail. O25 in the left tail. And again, from we've seen this a numerous times, that from the zero to Z table, if you have O25 in the tails, that means you have 475, 0 0.4750 in the zero to Z part, the fat part, and that critical value for Z is 1.96. So those are called the critical values. Anything between minus 1.96 and 1.96, we accept. That white region is accept. If you fall on the right tail, you're going to reject. And if you fall on the left tail, you're going to reject. Remember, you're rejecting if there's too much Coumadin or too little Coumadin. So you need to have two rejection regions. That's where we cut the alpha in half. Okay, so if we fall into that red 
in that red area, okay, the sh that in the shaded red area, then that that's a, called a rejection reading. So if you get a plus two or a plus three or a plus four, you're rejecting on the right side too much. And if you get on the left side too little, that's like a minus two, a minus three, a minus four, we reject on the left side. Now what we're going to do is take the sample evidence, turn it into a z-value, and see where the z-value takes us. Are we in the acceptance region? which means it could very well be sampling error, or we're going to be in the rejection region. So here's where we convert the sample evidence into a z-score, a z-value. 20.50 minus 20 over 0.80, that's your standard deviation, over the square root of n. What we end up with is um, 0.50 over 0.10, and that's equal to 5. Okay, so now we have a z-score of 5. Now, what does that tell us? Now, we're way into the rejection region. Okay, so we're going to reject the HO. Notice, we would have rejected at 1.97, 1.98, 1.9, 3, 4. We're at 5. That's basically telling us that the probability of getting this kind of sample evidence, if the claim is true, is very uh, low. It's very unlikely that this is going to happen. This sample evidence is not what you expect if your mu is 20 milligrams. We've just shown you how to do a hypothesis test. But let's show you another way of looking at this data. Remember, we're always working with the sample evidence. With a hypothesis test, we're, we're testing the claim using the sample evidence. But suppose there's no claim made, and all you want to do is estimation, you know, constructing a confidence interval. Watch how we do the same, almost the same thing, but from a different perspective. Here we take the sample evidence and we want to construct a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so we take the sample evidence, the X bar, 20.50 milligrams, plus or minus 1.96, because that gives you a um, two sided confidence interval if you want 95% confidence. So you do plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error of the mean, which we computed before, s over the square root of n, which was 0.10. And now we um, have constructed a 95% confidence interval. And we would have, based on that, we would have said we're 95% sure that the mu is, it's a fixed value, but it's somewhere, 95% confidence between 20.304 milligrams and 20. 0.696 milligrams. And notice, just on the basis of that, we would have known 20 is not like is not in that interval. So you can see that hypothesis testing and confidence intervals are basically almost the same thing. The two sides of the same coin, because both rely on the sample evidence. So if a claim is made about a parameter, if there's a claim made, you do a hypothesis test, because you're going to test that claim. If you won't test, the government's going to test it in some cases. If no claim is made, all you want to do is use sample evidence to estimate a parameter, and maybe even to determine what claims may be made in the future, then you can do a confidence interval. Both cases, you're relying on the sample evidence. So these are really two ways of looking at things. But uh, as far as you're concerned in the course, you know, if we ask you to construct a confidence interval, there's no claim was made. You're just constructing a confidence interval that you're either 90, 95, 99, or whatever percent sure contains the parameter. But once you hear claim, once you hear somebody making a claim about a parameter, you're going to take the sample evidence to test the claim and to see if the claim makes any sense and is reasonable. This is an example of a one-tail test. A company claims, notice you hear the word claim. The minute you hear that word claim, you know it's going to be a hypothesis test. They're claiming that their LED bulbs will last at least 8,000 hours. So you can take the sample evidence. If you, government, somebody's going to be testing the claim. You sample 100 bulbs, find that X bar, the sample mean is 7,800 hours, and the sample standard deviation is 800 hours. So should we reject the company's claim? We're going to test at an alpha of 0.05. Okay, so first we have to write down the HO and the H1. HO, the claim is mu is greater than 8,000 hours. Again, notice anything more than that is fine. 9, 10, no one's going to get upset if they're claiming uh, 8,000 hours and now the bulbs last 14,000 hours. It's good news. It's on the left side where there's the problem. 
And that's why HOs that use less than 8,000 hours. And that's why we need a statistical test, but it's all going to be on the left. It's a one tail test. So we take the entire alpha of 5%. It goes to the left. That means you have between 0 and Z, you have 45%, 0 0.4500. And now your critical value, since you're on the left, is minus 1.645. That's called the critical value. So we reject if you fall into that rejection region that's shaded in red. So anything less than minus 1.645, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, that's rejecting. Anything to the right of that, like let's say plus 4, you don't have to do a test. You're definitely okay. That's okay. But let's say between 0 and minus 1.645, you don't reject. That could be sampling error. Okay, now we're going to take the sample evidence turn it into a z-score. 7,800 minus 8,000, which is minus 200, over 800, the standard error of the mean, 800 over the square root of 100, that's 80, minus 200 over 80 is minus 2.50. Now, the computed Z value, that's called the computed or calculated Z value, that's your, basically your sample evidence converted into a Z-score. That sample evidence now is a Z-score of minus 2.50, and I see it's in the rejection region. So we reject HO. Because the probability of getting this sample evidence, if the claim is true and that mu is 8,000 or more, this is called 8,000 hours, the probability of getting this kind of sample evidence of 7,800 based on a sample size of 100 with a standard deviation of 800, the probability of getting all that is less than 5%. You can actually figure it out, you know, uh, certainly if you do it by computer, the computer will tell you the probability, but it's going to be less than 5%. There are a lot more problems on our website. Do as many problems as you can find. As always, practice, practice, practice. The more practice you get doing the problems, the better off you'll be on exams.